Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest, and this is a special HAL conversation with my dear friend and HAL Institute for Society board member, Darren Walker. Darren, as we all know, is the president of the Ford Foundation and really embodying uh, and manifesting at scale the kind of leadership uh, that the world so desperately needs. So welcome, Darren. Thank you, Dov, and that's a kind of introduction. I'm not sure I'm worthy of, of uh, such accolades. Well, uh, I know you are, and so many others uh, affirm that in all the ways in which they lean on you and, and look up to you. But I wanna say that we are gathered for this How Conversation on the occasion of the recent publication of this important book. Uh, and um, From Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel, I think it's a manifesto, it's a framework, it's an approach, it's a model for uh, creating, but more importantly, sharing and making wealth go around by reframing wealth as a matter of justice, uh, being philanthropic as a matter of justice. So before we dive in a bit into uh, your book, uh, what animates you and what inspired you to see and therefore reframe and reimagine philanthropy as a matter of justice? Well, Doug, for me, what frames uh, every day of my life is the history I have had in this great country. I was born in an America that believed in my promise that uh, did not believe because I was poor, born into a single headed household, uh, living in rural Texas and Louisiana, that my opportunities should be in any way diminished by my geography and uh, background. And so I had hope because hope is the oxygen of democracy. And so philanthropy, I like to say, in some ways is about the business of hope. Mm. We, through our work, can make a difference in the lives of people uh, in small ways, one at a time, and by systemic change at scale. Mm. Darren, what define hope. Hope is believing in what you may not be able to see. It's aspiring for something that feels very far away. Right. That is what I had. I, uh, living in Ames, Texas as a little boy, when I would uh, read in Ebony Magazine and see the lives and lifestyles of middle class uh, African-Americans. I could imagine an America uh, that was uh, a better place than the one I was in. And that is what gave me hope for a better future, a better tomorrow. I assume that there were those around you or something was happening in your context to inspire hope in you so that you could imagine uh, reaching higher and going farther. One of my uh, most impactful uh, experiences growing up was of my experience with Mrs. Majors in the fourth grade. Mrs. Majors was uh, an extraordinary educator. I got in a fight one day. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Majors saw me fighting in the hall. I met with her and she said, you should be ashamed of yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed of you. I know you can do better, but let me make one thing clear to you. This was a white woman telling me this. She said, little Negro boys who cannot control themselves get into trouble and you have to exercise self-control. I'd never had anyone talk to me about self-control or how to contain my rage or uh, my anger, which was frequent at that time because I had a very chaotic uh, home life. Um, but that was a life lesson for me that continues yeah. to this day. How are you going about inspiring hope in others? 
And then I do want to get back to justice as your articulation of philanthropy, but just stay on this important topic of hope because you and I came of age also in the capitalistic sphere where people said hope is not a strategy. Uh, forget this hope stuff through planning, budgeting, and control. We're going to you know, superimpose a future. And deep in your heart, you know that without hope, there is no strategy. So I love the centrality of hope that that, that hope plays in your model of leadership. But talk about how do, we, how do we inspire it in others in today's age? Well, I agree it is about inspiration and it is not about saying I have the answers. One of the things I find is how often people say to me, um, and I accept this with great humility, thank you for inspiring me. And I think what they mean is I'm a Black gay man uh, with a particular background that in some ways is uh, is not normal uh, mm -hmm. in the elite uh, circles, uh, unfortunately not normal, uh, that we uh, find ourselves in. And I think that's regrettable, but it does, uh, it, it does embolden me to tell my story, to be proud of my background, um, and to speak uh, truth as I see it. I mean, these are the ways in which leaders yeah. have to communicate. But as you and I also know um, from our work at POW, that communication has to be authentic. Uh, it has to be perceived uh, as authentic and you have to be perceived as authentic as a leader. Tell us about the journey from generosity to justice. That journey, what is your conception of justice? What has the pandemic revealed about society to make justice the central focus of, of your work? I found uh, in uh, a, a rather obscure uh, speech that Dr. King made in 1968, a few months before he was murdered. And he said the following about philanthropy. Philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what Dr. King was saying was something else, that philanthropy, yes, is about uh, the idea of charity and generosity, but it should also be about dignity and justice. And so what King was uh, encouraging, uh, demanding, was that uh, philanthropists interrogate our mm -hmm. own complicity in the very mm -hmm. problems we seek to solve. Uh, and so he was holding the mirror up and saying, mm -hmm. it's not enough to be generous. Uh, it's not enough to give alms. Uh, you have to um, uh, consider just how much you have contributed. Uh, and that's a very different idea of philanthropy. For me, the fundamental idea of philanthropy and justice, especially justice, is the basic notion of dignity, that every person should live with dignity. Dove, the number of people you and I know, I know you are a graduate of a very prestigious <laughs> Ivy League school, who are progressive um, and who consider themselves generous people. Uh, but when confronted with the suggestion that we should do away with legacy programs and initiatives, um, become silent, or in fact, resist the idea that this privilege, which again, compounds their privilege and the life opportunities for their children who are already uh, in a, such a better place, so much farther along. Uh, and yet they want to hold on to something that even further accelerates the inequality mm -hmm. in our system, which they profess to want to address. So in small ways and in large ways, this question of conversations about how do we uh, think about what's the difference is between giving back and giving up uh, is a very challenging conversation. 
So Darren, I, I, I'm fond of saying that in order to create shared prosperity or shared value, you actually need shared values. Without shared values, you can't pursue shared value. What will allow you to do the sharing? What's your theory of distributive justice? What if there's not enough to go along and you need some normative framework to uh, make sacrifices and shared burdens? Uh, where are we in terms of the shared values required to be on a journey of of shared prosperity and shared value? For many, we seem to have lost uh, a sense and a commitment to our shared American identity. Um, it is a dangerous place because you, some, feel uh, ill-equipped to engage in it, and some are fearful of engaging because engaging might uh, reveal that you uh, are ignorant of a particular community. Uh, it might reveal that your background hasn't prepared you for the more diverse world we live in. And therefore, you may say something that can be misinterpreted and the consequences of which could be material. Mm -hmm. And and so if if one is afraid of engaging uh, and and the people who we need to be in the public square retreat from the public square, then the public square is left to the toxifiers. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. a business model. Uh, hate is profitable. Yeah. And so when you have a system where the public square um, needs to have everybody in it, uh, but you find that the, the square seems to be filled uh, increasingly with haters, um, it's hard to want to engage. The Greek root of philanthropy, as you know, Darren, it, is, is lover of people or lover, lover of humankind. Is it fair to say that as you want to inspire a transition from generosity to justice, you're actually making philanthropy not just for those who have a lot of means. It's everybody can be philanthropic if dignity and justice is the ethos, right? So uh, what can anybody do to be philanthropic in your conception of philanthropy? Well, it is uh, and it does begin with love. A love of humankind and a belief that love is possible uh, and that love can heal. There's no doubt in my mind of that uh, philanthropy has to uh, be uh, a mechanism by which people can demonstrate uh, their love for each other. And it is why uh, some of the most effective philanthropists in this country are people whose names you and I have never heard because in their communities, in their small towns, in their villages, uh, in their slums, uh, in, in parts of the world, they are demonstrating their love for humankind, their brothers and sisters, by offering very modest person-to-person -person help and assistance. What is the role in your conception of philanthropy uh, and justice of humility? So there's hope, there's love, and I think the, the third prong uh, or pillar is, is humility, right? It is humility, but humility uh, and ego uh, are uh, critical ingredients. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, there is often um, an inverse relationship between a uh, humility and the ego when it comes to effective philanthropy. I, I am reminded of a, a billionaire uh, philanthropist who went to Eastern Africa and I met with him after the trip and he said, my wife and I have decided we want to start uh, uh, with our foundation um, a new program to help with rural health in Tanzania. And my question to him was, who asked you to do that? Hmm. Who in Tanzania asked you to create uh, a rural health program? There are dozens of rural health programs in Tanzania. Uh, why don't you ask some of the leaders of those organizations how you can help them Right. rather than 
uh, just immediately believing that what's needed is for you and your wife uh, and your family to set up uh, in your image uh, and in your name of uh, a, a program in Tanzania. Um, that's uh, unfortunately uh, not unusual. And so my point is when you uh, center the people and the communities you want to impact, you will often hear what you don't know and you will hear solutions that are more authentic, more likely to be uh, sustained and owned. You talk about engaging the other uh, through the five senses. Uh, paint that picture because that'll probably allow you to balance humility and ego uh, and get them in some form of equilibrium. Describe what you, what you paint the picture of what it means to engage in all, with all five senses, the way you put it. Well, I think you have to, um, with your eyes, you have to be able to see. And you have to be able to see uh, and believe things that you uh, that may not be in front of you. But you have to see the, the people. You have to see uh, and believe in them. You have to listen to them. You have to uh, genuinely believe that they uh, can help and that they have wisdom and knowledge uh, that you don't have. And that expertise is not found in just the, um, the, the, the experts uh, with PhDs uh, in public policy. Uh, we have to speak in ways that reflect uh, empathy, sympathy, um, uh, a sense of um, generosity, a sense of um, a belief uh, that um, we, we want to be engaged in a real dialogue not just me, wealthy person, speaking to you, speaking at you, but actually in a dialogue, hearing you. Where are we today with your conception of capitalism? How are you navigating the push and pulls of it? Um, especially right now where there seems to be a, a pullback and, and, and economic impair, you know, challenges that are motivating the pullback when we should nonetheless transcend. Where are you on capitalism? Well, there's no doubt that uh, I um, consider myself a disciple of Adam Smith and uh, his uh, Moral Sentiments uh, book. And yet most people do not know, uh, I should say, most adherents to capitalism who quote Adam Smith um, are unfamiliar, are ignorant of the full richness of his philosophy, which was a moral philosophy, not simply an economic uh, philosophy. But your point about this moment we're in around ESG and stakeholder capitalism is real. Um, and it is a shame that uh, we, th th these are not ideologies and that ideologists have taken um, um, from, um, from many of us uh, these, these fundamental notions that are just about fairness, uh, are about uh, long-term sustainability, are about ensuring that the future, uh, there can be hope. And that's, that, to my mind, is where frameworks, uh, the kind I've learned um, from you and uh, being a part of uh, the Howe Institute, uh, is so important because it allows us to uh, have an understanding of how we make courageous, uh, principle-based decisions. How do we inspire courage besides just being examples of it? Well, I, I think that uh, being an example, hopefully, uh, it cannot be underestimated. And I don't particularly hold myself out as an example, Dove. Um, I truly don't. I do, though, feel compelled to both acknowledge and act, uh, act on my privilege. Um, I, have a, I have a platform, um, and I communicate, and I have to use uh, those privileges to contribute to bettering our society and expressing love for humankind. And that can put one at risk uh, when uh, you are prepared to 
uh, write uh, an op-ed for the New York Times, you are opening up yourself to receiving um, vitriolic messages. Uh, mm -hmm. As I do every time I, I write something, um, you absolutely have to be prepared to put something on the line. Um, and I think that that's only right because we privileged people have so much to put on the right. line. Uh, when we gathered at the Ford Foundation for the Howe Institute Summit on Moral Leadership and you spoke to those to the to our community of, of common cause, you offered a succinct definition of moral leadership and, and how moral leaders walk a fine line in the world that I think keeps you honest and allows you to walk that fine line. You said moral leadership is about being righteous, but not self-righteous. Feels to me that that distinction allows you to write in the New York Times and be out there uh, as long as you're trying to be righteous uh, thoughtfully, but not self-righteous. Is that a fair way to play that back to you? Yes, it is. And it's it's uh, understanding that this is not about lecturing people or naming and shaming people uh, or polarizing us. It's about uh, finding the common language that speaks to us all. But it does require a willingness to sometimes make people uncomfortable, not for the sort of perverse joy of making uh, of the privileged uncomfortable, uh, but to actually engage with people in thoughtful ways that recognizes um, that while there are some people who truly are not interested in bridge building in uh, working collectively, most people in this country would wish to do that. So Darren, I mentioned the New York, the, the New York Times. So uh, you recently wrote uh, a, a highly personal essay. Uh, it was an editorial in the New York Times, but you you made an argument, uh, but you also did it in personal terms following the Supreme Court's recent ruling on affirmative action. I'll quote uh, a, a little bit of what really jumped out at me, where you, you celebrated uh, diversity by saying that diversity, and you said that there are studies that prove this, but it was also your your truth. Diversity enhances critical thinking, creativity, and collaboration, as well as productivity, profitability, and performance. It is a national tragedy that diversity is now a contested issue rather than of common interest. And we should tell the truth about why diversity is now controversial. Opponents of diversity are opponents of any racial consciousness. They want to prevent us from understanding the ways that the past informs the present, from wrestling with the fullness and richness and complexity of our history. What are you in touch with that made you say that besides the studies that empirically uh, help make your case? Well, first, as I lay out, I am most definitely an affirmative action baby. Hmm. There's no doubt that without affirmative action, I would not be here. Uh, that is not to say that I am in any way an underperformer. It is to say that uh, the institutions uh, and uh, the American uh, society and most importantly, public policy recognized that people like me historically uh, have had the doors shut. We are not going as a society to um, erase the reality of uh, the problems, the legacy of racism in our country by simply wishing it away or legislating that we can't talk about slavery uh, mm -hmm. or, or we can't talk about racism in ways that make uh, some of us uncomfortable. This is not going to help our country. What's going to help our country is if we are able to understand the fullness, the richness of this great country and hold that both things can be true, that we have a great history mm. that in, has inspired people around the globe and made us the envy of the world. And at the same time, we have a stain of racism and racial caste that has held back too many of us. You invoked Martin Luther King 
a, a man of a great moral leader and a man of faith. And he said, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. And, and may, it's a beautiful expression of faith to use the present tense. It bends. It might take five years, 50 years, 500 years. When I listen to you for the last hour, it feels like part of what you're arguing is to have hope that it shall bend, that it bends. But there's a lot of bending that we can do by putting our shoulder into the arc, right? What we can all do to bend it is rededicate ourselves to the American experiment. Commit ourselves to, in our own communities, speaking to people who we don't always speak to, finding places and spaces to be present with people who don't always look like us or have our backgrounds, uh, extending oneself um, in, in generous ways, um, in curious ways, being better active listeners. Uh, in our communities uh, are, in my view, essential to build a community. Darren, there's, a, there's an adage that uh, when you come from the heart, you enter the heart. Uh, thank you for sharing so much insight uh, and wisdom, uh, but doing it from the heart and, and touching us. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Darren, truly. Thank you, Doug.